Let me introduce Lars Rampa. Welcome back. Let, let me introduce Lars Rampa from the University of Liverpool, who will be talking uh, on a counterexample to Euromenko's conjecture. Thank you very much, and uh, many thanks to the organizers for uh, bringing us to this wonderful place and uh, inviting us here. It, uh, it's been uh, fantastic, and uh, many thanks to Carsten, or maybe we should thank Carsten's parents, you know, for the opportunity to uh, celebrate his birthday, uh, um, his uh, 60th birthday, slightly belatedly. Um, so apologies to those, I know some of you have heard my talk before, um, but I understand that the birthday boy has not, and I think also the organizer has not, so I thought it was a, an appropriate talk to give. Um, um, there are some, some changes to my slides, maybe you'll spot them. Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk about a counterexample to Eremenko's conjecture. So uh, let me tell you, let me start by telling you about Eremenko's conjecture, and then I'll give a little bit of background and some previous work, and uh, um, then I'll tell you about our results, uh, which I should say are joint with uh, David Marty Peter and James Waterman. So, um, Eremenko's conjecture um, came from this paper of Alex Eremenko, 1989, um, where he studied for the first time what we call the escaping set of a general transcendental entire function. So, the escaping set, well, so we start with a transcendental entire function. Um, so there's just a holomorphic self-map of the complex plane, which is not a polynomial, right? So like the exponential map of sine or cosine, but there is a very, very large variety of entire functions beyond those simple examples, as you will probably gather if you don't already know it by the end of this talk. So we do the same thing we always do in a complex dynamics conference, so I guess I don't have to uh, explain to you about iteration, right? So we consider F to be the uh, evolution rule of a dynamical system, and we ask what happens when we compose F with itself, what happens to the orbits, and uh, here's a very simple set to define, although not quite so easy to study, and that's what we call the escaping set. It's the set of points which converge to infinity under iteration. So it's a set that's uh, easy to write down. Um, turns out that you know, it's been quite difficult in some cases to really understand what goes on with this set. Um, but before I tell uh, you more about that, let's uh, uh, state a theorem that Alex proved. Uh, so he showed that whichever transcendental entire function we take, the escaping set is always non-empty, which is good if we want to use this set to study something. And then as a consequence, uh, well, as a consequence of the maximum modulus theorem, he also proved that uh, every connected component of the closure of the escaping set is unbounded. So um, I haven't defined the Fatou and Julia set, but I think I don't need to in this conference. So, uh, um, so what's the closure of the escaping set? Well, the boundary of the escaping set will always be the whole Julia set. So the closure of the escaping set is simply the Julia set together with any for two components in which the iterates go to infinity. And we will talk more about some such for two components um, a little later. So why study the escaping set? So um, many here, I think, know polynomial dynamics, the iteration of a polynomial map. Uh, and we'll know that in this case, what we call the escaping set in transcendental dynamics is simply the basin of infinity. Right? Infinity is now actually a super attracting um, fixed point. So it has a, you know, we can think of the map on the sphere, and it's just an attracting basin of this. Um, and this set is foliated, well, at least if the Julia set is connected, by external rays. And we use these external rays, which limit on the Julia set, to study the Julia set. Right? In particular, when these rays fit together. So here, we've had the rabbit already. So this is uh, the rabbit quadratic polynomial. We have the inside bit, the filled in Julia set, which is in gray and black. And then we have the white outside of the basin of infinity, and we've got these external rays which come in, and these three, for example, pinch off over here. And we have this pinching behavior. We can use it to cut up the Julia set and study the Julia set. And this is a powerful technique used by your course first, and since then by many, many, many people. And I'm sure we will hear many talks about uh, puzzle techniques in this conference. Um, so, for polynomials, certainly, the basin of infinity is very important, 
right? This fact that we have these things inside the basin of infinity, we can use them to cut up the Julia set, get some combinatorics going, um, tends to be really, really important for uh, almost all of the success, all of the major success, I would say, in polynomial dynamics, or much of it, certainly, um, relies on this structure. Um, now, when we have a transcendental entire function, the situation, the situation is different. So uh, our escaping set is not R. Ah, it says F. It's meant to say I of F. I have given this talk before. Either it disappeared or it was never there and I never noticed this. So this is meant to say I of F. I of F is an F sigma delta, but never an F sigma set. So remember, an F sigma set is a countable union of closed sets. And an F sigma delta is an intersection of such a countable union of closed sets. So if you write down the definition, it's a simple exercise, write down the defini definition and see that um, it's an F sigma delta set. Whether it could ever be an F sigma set was a question of uh, Phil Rippon, which I managed to answer um, recently, um, that this is never the case. So it's a topologically, to the point, I don't want to talk about that, but the point is it's a topologically somewhat complicated um, and subtle set, which is something to do with, with, the, with the questions, uh, that, that the questions that we're going to ask are difficult. So you shouldn't think of this escaping set as like an open or closed set, because if you did, then a lot of the subtlety of what we're doing would be lost. So um, nonetheless, there's often some structure in the escaping set. There are many cases where we know that there are structures within the escaping set which we can use, again, to understand the Julia set. So in particular, in, in some situations, there are these curves to infinity. So here's an example. This is uh, a map of the form e to the z plus a, where a is a constant. And uh, you know, we've got uh, some attracting cycle of some high period, which is called in, in different colors. And then inside the Julia set and the escaping set, there is this curve which goes here and it lands at this fixed point. How smooth is that curve? Oh, that curve is smooth, of course. It's a result of, of Marcelo Viana. It's C infinity. C infinity. What we don't know is whether it's real analytic. That's, a, that's, a, that's an open question. It's an open question I don't know. Um, and it's definitely not smooth in its end point. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, this idea that we can use these curves, at least in some cases, as analogs of these dynamic rays for polynomials has been around for a long time and actually been used very successfully. So uh, um, that's not what I'm talking about today. Um, but there are many results um, where, where, this has been, where this, this has been done. And we, we have further results. And, and you know, we're developing a theory uh, for cases where we can do this, even when we don't have curves, actually. But um, the, po the point is, if you understand the escaping set, because the escaping set well, the boundary of the escaping set is the Julia set, then we might have some hope of understanding the Julia set. Uh, in particular, if we have these structures of curves, of unbounded sets that go out to infinity, we might have some hope of cutting up the plane. So Eremenko's conjecture concerns the escaping set of a general transcendental entire function. And he says in his paper, it is plausible that the set I of F has no bounded connected components. So he proved that the closure of the set I of F has no bounded connected components. And his conjecture is that this is true for the um, escaping set itself. Um, or as I sometimes like to say it differently, oh no, I don't have it here. OK, sorry. I have a, I have a, I have a rhymed version of this, but I decided not to put it on the, on the slides today. Um, so, so we can say it slightly differently. If F is the transcendental entire function, Eremenko's conjecture stated that every connected component of the escaping set is unbounded. OK, so this is a question which is quite easy to state, right? You only need to know what is a transcendental entire function. I um, guess you need to know what is a connected component um, and what it means to converge to infinity. So do usually teach that to our undergraduate students, certainly. So uh, um, the question itself we can phrase, but it turned out not to be quite so easy to study. So. Um, let me talk a little bit around Eremenko's conjecture, so write a theme and variation, so that we could ask different versions of this question. So different versions of this questions, question have been asked and answered. Uh, and the answers have gone in different ways. Um, and uh, I should also say that Eremenko's conjecture has been quite a central problem in transcendental dynamics. So much of the work that's been done over the past few years has been inspired in some way you know, or by Eremenko's conjecture. And I'll try and say a few words about this. I could probably give a whole talk about it, which I don't want to do, but I will try and say a few words about it as I talk about these results. So um, 
So variation one. So this is where the topology comes in. So you, <laughs> you have to get your point set topology out a little bit to see that this is not equivalent to Eremenko's conjecture. So the, the variation, we could, instead of asking whether the escaping set has only unbounded connected component, oh, sorry, sorry, it's variation two. So this one, is, this one is clearly weaker. There's a second version which is not clearly, well, which is also clearly weaker if you know topology. Sorry, I had them this way around. So this way around, the first question is the escaping set has at least one unbounded connected component. Okay, so this is clearly a weaker version, right? If we're asking all the components are unbounded, then we should at least maybe ask, is there at least one, right? And it turns out that this is true. So this was proved by uh, Phil Rippon and Gwyneth Stallard in uh, 2005. And actually, the, the way that they did this, this was, uh, had, had some profound um, influence upon uh, uh, transcendental dynamics in the following, because they introduced uh, another set, or actually the set had already been introduced by Bergweiler and Hinkallen as sort of an auxiliary object, but um, Ripon and Stallard gave an alternative description which showed it to be quite fundamental, and this is what's known as the fast escaping set. It's full of those points that go to infinity essentially as fast as they could, under, at a rate that's as fast as it could be under the iteration of our given function. Um, and again, I don't want to talk about the fast escaping set, um, but just to say that set, for that set it turns out that Eremenko's conjecture is true. So that set only has unbounded connected components. And that set is an, is an F-sigma, so it's topologically somehow simpler. And, uh, and uh, it's al also always non-empty. That already follows from Alex's original proof. So what are your results? Is it known that these two have to be different? Yes. There's a result, but, but also this was a, I think F Phil and Gwyneth gave talks about this and someone asked this question and they were like, oh, we never thought of this. So they proved, a, they proved that you can always have points that escape arbitrarily slowly. And in fact, that was important in proving the results about the escaping set I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, okay, so, so in particular, there's at least one component of the, of the fast escaping set. And that component has to be unbounded, and it's contained in a component of the escaping set. So there's always at least one unbounded component of the escaping set. So here's the second variation. That's the one I was trying to get to, just saying that's not quite so obvious. The escaping set union infinity is connected. OK? So if we think of a, co of a closed set in the plane, then this is equivalent to saying every connected component is unbounded. If we have a set that's not, then they're not equivalent. In fact, there exist sets which are connected, where we take out one point, and they become totally disconnected. In fact, these appear in transcendental dynamics. Um, it's yet another talk, which I'm not giving. But this is possible, right? So, so but um, I mean, how can this happen? Maybe I will draw a picture. Just, you know, if you've never thought of these things, here's a very simple way of making such a set which together with infinity is connected. I'm not going to make one which has an explosion point, but just one which is connected with infinity but disconnected without. So I could imagine I take just some bunch of things like this. I mean, I could make it easier, but for, there's a reason that I'm drawing it like this. So they go in. These converge to some point. So I take all these sets together with this point. OK? So in the complex plane, this set is disconnected, and these are its connected component and this point. So this connected component is bounded. But when I add an infinity, all of these guys are in the same connected component. And the closure of a connected set in any space is, again, connected. So the whole space is also connected because this component is dense. You have a de if you have a dense connected set, then the space is connected. Right? So this is an example of a set in the plane which, together with infinity, is connected but which has a point-connected component. Turns out this is kind of, good, kind of a good picture to have in mind. So, but this is true. So this one is always true. So this was also proved by uh, Phil Ripon and Gunnar Stallard. Um, okay. Let's go on. I don't want to, uh, yeah, I need to, uh, be a little bit faster so I get to tell you something about the actual results. But, uh, so I'll go through this a little bit more quickly. But so this is a version that Alex actually asked in his paper also because it was motivated by these curves in the escaping set. And so he was asking whether it's true that every point in the escaping set could be connected to infinity by a curve in the escaping set. And this um, turned out to be false. 
So we proved that this was false in uh, this annals paper with uh, Günther Rottenfusser, Johannes Rückert, and Dirk Schleicher in 2011. And uh, also this, uh, you know, this, together with some other developments in the class that we were looking at, studying this caping set, has led to a really successful program in trying to understand a very large class of transcendental entire functions. Um, also then, you know, for those who know what the class S is, so these are functions with finitely many singular values, um, there was a question whether it could be realized there or not. Then Chris Bishop came up with a technique which has been extremely influential, again, sort of um, um, inspired by this. Um, and the final version, which we might ask about, is the so-called uniform version of Eremenko's conjecture. So this isn't written anywhere, but Alex told me this in a cafe in Liverpool sometime when he came to visit, that this was what he had in mind. Um, so th we are asking here not just to be able to connect the point to infinity by some connected set, but that the iterates on this set go to infinity uniformly. And this also turns out to be false. Uh, I'm on model connected set A containing Z. Yes. Thank you. OK. You would have thought after having given this talk twice, I would have caught all the titles. Apologies. Thank you very much. I have to remember to put that in uh, before I post the slides. Usually, yes, yes. Yeah, I can. No, no, this is very interesting, and there's a very, a very interesting new result with Letitia Pardo Simon that I could talk about, but then I wouldn't be talking about uh, what I want to talk about. So, um, yes, so, so, um, so what actually happens is what can happen um, is that you can have a function which has a component of the Julia set, and, and in this case, you know, this, the whole component of the Julia set is in the escaping set in this case. Um, so, the component of the Julia set, which is actually an arc to infinity. And all the points, as I said, go to infinity, but there's no, no sub arc that contains the endpoint that goes to infinity uniformly. So somehow the endpoint goes to infinity, all the points go to infinity, but this curve keeps coming back to some bounded part of the flame. So this can also happen. So, so um, nonetheless, there are many situations. So, so we have seen now four, four variations. Two of them turned out, two of them were weaker, turned out to be true. Two of them were stronger, turned out to be false. Um, there are also a lot of cases where we know that Eremenko's conjecture holds. Um, and I think I will go through this rel relatively quickly. And actually, maybe I won't comment on them. Um, so so um, I'll just, I just go through them, <laughs> show, show you them all. So there's a whole bunch of cases where we do know that Eremenko's conjecture holds. For example, in these counterexamples from the previous slide, we know that Eremenko's conjecture actually holds, because these are functions which are hyperbolic. They have bounded post singular set in this case. Um, I proved that Eremenko's conjecture always holds. Um, there are cases where we know that these curves exist, that these hairs exist, and so on. Um, OK, so this, of course, still leaves the question of what happens with Eremenko's conjecture itself in general. And um, there were some challenges, so I tried to solve this question for not quite 20 years, but uh, not, well, certainly more than 15. Um, and, uh, and the difficulties were, so there are two difficulties, really. The first one was to really understand what a counterexample would look like because uh, the simplest functions that we might look at, hyperbolic functions, for example, we know that Eremenko's conjecture holds. So we were going to have to have some kind of behavior, either, well, we are going to have something which is sort of a little bit more complicated. So how could you get, you know, you have to have the set which is, it has all these unbounded connected components, and it is connected when you add an infinity. Um, but it has some bounded connected components. So what does that mean? So actually, to, to understand the structure, but then the second challenge, uh, sorry, the second challenge was, uh, you know, even if we have an idea, so I had an idea of how to build possibly some examples, um, um, but to build those examples would, would require um, a lot of control on the construction in order to actually realize it, to make sure that nothing, nothing bad was happening. Um, No, no, but you have to have some idea of what a counterexample could look like. You don't necessarily have to understand them all, but uh, you know, there, there's various ways in which we know these counterexamples can't arise. So you have to come up with some picture of how, how, how they could arise. So, so um, um, 
Well, anyway, may maybe it will make sense, or maybe these questions will not make sense, but at the end of the talk, hopefully, you will understand what a counterexample will look like, because uh, that's the theorem. So there exists, in fact, a transcendental entire function um, whose escaping set has a connected component consisting of a single point. And as I said, I, I was kind of working on, on constructing a counterexample for quite some time, and then it turned out in a completely unrelated project that we managed to construct a counterexample completely different from the ones that I was looking for, so, uh, uh, which was a nice surprise, Earl earlier this year, actually. Um, um, okay, so I want to try to explain to you where this came from and, uh, and how to construct this. Did you get it totally disconnected? No, it cannot be totally disconnected because it always has unbounded connected components. So, so, so there, there are some versions of this, but maybe, I'll, maybe, maybe because I'm worried, I will not actually get to, to explain to you the counterexample. So, uh, um, Okay, so I'm going to switch track here. So the, the, the project that it came out of was a project which was actually about wandering domains. Um, so we weren't thinking about Eremenko's conjecture at all. We were thinking about wandering domains. So let me tell you about wandering domains. So um, <coughs> you probably have all heard of wandering domains, but uh, let's, just, uh, let's just make sure that we understand. So the Fatou set is just as for polynomials, the locus of normality, uh, you know, the set of equicontinuity where the iterates are nice and stable. Its complement is the Julia set. And a wandering domain is a connected component of the Fatou set whose iterates are always disjoint from each other as you go forward. Right? So this is sort of important. So if there are any questions about, at any point, actually, just uh, let me know. Now, the famous theorem by Sullivan, of course, says that rational maps do not have wandering domains. Entire functions, however, may have wandering domains. They do exist. And you can write down some explicit examples. You may or may not have seen those. But I'm going to give you a different way of seeing that wandering domains exist, um, which is using approximation theory, because that's relevant for what we are doing. So uh, there are various approximation theorems. OK, so um, I'm going to uh, give you one, which is Arakelian's theorem, or rather a special case of this. So this is, again, this is important, so I want to make sure that we understand this. So Arakelian's theorem. Um, well, it's actually about uh, approximating arbitrary functions by holomorphic functions on some op open set. So a function given on some closed subset of some open set trying to find a holomorphic function on the larger set that approximates it. But I'm just going to talk about the plane. So the question is this. Suppose that I have a closed set in the plane. I have some continuous function on it. When can I approximate any such, well, not quite any such function? Um, any, any reasonable such function by an entire function arbitrarily closely. So what do I mean by any reasonable such function? Well, if I want to be able to approximate arbitrarily closely, then I have to be holomorphic on the interior of the set. Because the uniform limit of holomorphic functions is again holomorphic. It's the theorem of Weierstrass. Right? It just follows from well, whatever representation of functions by integrals and uh, um, so, so the function has to be holomorphic on its interior. But suppose that we have such a function on a closed set. It's continuous. It's holomorphic on the interior. Can we approximate it arbitrarily closely by an entire function? And our Kellyan theorem gives a condition. And in fact, it's a necessary and sufficient condition on the set A for this to be possible. And the condition is, the first condition is that um, the complement of A, union infinity, is connected. So this just means that, forget about the infinity, this just means that this has no bounded connected component. This is an open set. So this is not, adding infinity is not one of these funny things that we talked about before. It really just means that every co uh, complementary component is unbounded. So we have no holes. And then there's this additional condition that this set should be locally connected at infinity, which is sort of connected to this. But it's sort of a version at infinity. Anyway, I don't want you to worry about that one because it'll be trivially true in all of the cases that I'm, that I'm going to. If the set is kind of sufficiently nice at infinity, then, then we can apply our Kellyan's theorem. So this says, suppose that we have such a set, we have such a function, we can approximate it arbitrarily closely by an entire function. And um, it's a very nice theorem. There are other approximation theorems that one might want to use. Um, I'm just going to use this one for today. Um, <laughs> Bless you. Um, so the first people to use approximation theory to construct wandering domains were Alex Remenko and Michal Jubic in 1989. 
Um, they didn't do the thing that I'm just going to do. Um, they did more interesting things. Um, but I'm just going to show you how to construct a wandering domain, a, simple, a very simple proof that there are wandering domains using approximation theory. OK? So it will be useful to understand this. So we start with a sequence of disks in the plane. I've drawn them here going up. It doesn't really matter. The main thing is they go to infinity. And it's not really important that the disks, they could be any sort of Jordan domain, certainly. So for example, they might look like this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to construct a wandering domain whose orbit, you know, a wandering domain that, that contains, uh, contains d naught, and then the image of the wandering domain is contained in the wandering domain containing d1, and so on, right? So we'll go off up to infinity. So how do we do this? Well, we just build our function g that we want to approximate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this whole thing, the closure of this, and map it right inside, let's say, to a point inside d1. That's a holomorphic function. That's OK. Of course, my entire function will not map everything to a point, but it will be very close to it, right? Um, I can take this function down here, do, take the, do the same thing, map it inside here, and go upwards. So now I could apply Arakelian's theorem. I will get an entire function that maps whose iterate on d0 go to infinity uniformly. So certainly d0 will be in the Fatou set, and it'll be one of those components where the iterates go to infinity. But for it to be a wandering domain, we should make sure that these are all disjoint. Now, there are various ways we can do this. For example, actually, if I made these things go to infinity very quickly, it would sort of be automatically satisfied for reasons of hyperbolic geometry. One can, if you had an invariant component, then, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to do something different, but it's even easier. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, first of all, an extra, there was something missing there, wasn't there? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've drawn an extra disk down here. So um, this disk I'm going to map inside itself, again, the same way, just map it to the center, right, by my map G. So I'm going to create an attracting basin. So what I certainly know is that any points that are in the attracting basin of this fixed point will not be in the same Fatou component as any of these. And now, I'm drawing some lines. So these lines go all the way to infinity in between them. And these lines, I just map inside my attracting basin, which I can do. So this is a set that I can apply Arakelian's theorem to. And so I do it. <laughs> I approximate by a function you know, up to a small error, small enough that the same structure will hold for my approximating function f. And now I've constructed a wandering domain. Is that clear? So this is kind of important. This is sort of the, 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 the very base case of, of any of the things that we're doing. Right? So, so this is the sort of thing, this is the sort of thing we're doing. Um, well, not quite. So there's, there's, a, there's a crucial difference between this and our construction, which I will talk about. But so wandering domains exist. Everyone agree? There are entire functions of wandering domains. OK, so the wandering domain that we just constructed is in the escaping set, as I said. Iterates go to infinity uniformly, in, well, locally uniformly inside this wandering domain. Such a wandering domain is called escaping. Now, it could also happen that they don't go to infinity. In particular, it could happen that they accumulate at infinity and come back to a bounded part of the plane. Now, there's a case I'm not talking about here, and that's another very interesting question, which I'm not going to talk about. But, uh, so that, that kind of wandering domain is called oscillating. So it's something which goes out and comes back, goes out and comes back. We don't know whether there's any other kind of wandering domain. That's an open question. We don't, we don't know whether there could be a wandering domain where the orbits are bounded. And probably if, if we knew that such a thing couldn't happen, then we'd have a new proof of Sullivan's theorem that doesn't use quasi-conformal surgery. So it is a... Well, if that was true, it would be. A so every, every orbit inside the wandering domain is bounded. Of any point inside the wandering domain is bounded. Or the omega limit set is bounded, right? I'm not talking about the wandering domains themselves or the accumulation set. So that's a, that's a very big question, but I, again, I'm not shedding any light on that one. Um, so Erlenko and Ubich were the first to show this is what they used approximation theory for um, that such an oscillating wandering domain can exist. And they do a similar thing. They build a function g, and they approximate it. But now you have to be careful, because you're approximating on some bounded part of the plane. 
um, you know, you have to be careful when you, when, you, when you do your approximation. So they can't just use something like Arakelian's theorem. They use a modified version of Runge's theorem, um, which allows you to prescribe exactly the values at certain points. And somehow, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a slightly subtle construction, but they manage to control things enough in order to, to, to construct this. Um, I will give you now another proof of this, which uses a different method. Um, which uh, sort of doesn't really involve those subtleties and is therefore more flexible. And this is a key idea in our constructions, which is that uh, instead of obtaining our function by one approximation, so we build a function, we apply one approximation theorem once, and then we have our entire function, we're going to build it in stages. So we're going to have a, function, a sequence fn, and then fn plus 1 approximates the map. Actually, this should be gn plus 1. Not that it matters, but it will be gn plus 1 in, the, in my slides, um, which agrees with the previous map on a large, set, large subset of the plane. But then I'm changing something somewhere close to infinity. And by doing this, the, key, the advantage of this is that I can use the properties of fn in defining gn plus 1. So I don't need to know exactly where things go under Fn, I just need to know sort of qualitatively the behavior of Fn, and I can then use that to define my map um, Gn plus 1, which will, yeah, so this definitely it was meant to be Gn plus 1, um, which I will then approximate with Fn plus 1. And I'll give you an example now by showing you how to construct an oscillating wandering domain. So <clears throat> here we are. So we have a sequence of disks going up again. And the wandering domain that I want to construct, so what would such an oscillating wandering domain look like, or what could it look like? So it's going to look like this. My function is going to map these yellow disks always up over these, you know, basically onto this disk, or almost anyway, covering these, this blue and this yellow disk, and this one up here as well, and this one up here as well. And then my wandering domain will start inside this blue bit. Ah, so this, uh, OK, slightly <laughs> doesn't like me. Um, I don't know, maybe if I get closer to the computer. So this um, maps inside this yellow bit. Now, this yellow bit maps up here. So what's going to happen is that my wandering domain now goes inside this blue bit, which maps back down again into the yellow bit. But this time, it maps up into here, which maps, uh, maps, maps up into this blue bit. And so the next thing is going to happen is, again, we're going to go down into the yellow, up, up. And now we go up into the next blue one up there. So we'll always go up one step further. So we're accumulating on some orbit that goes to infinity, but we sort of follow it along, and then we go back even closer to it. We follow it along some further, and we go back closer to it, and so on. So that's the structure of, the wandering, of this oscillating wandering domain. Um, so how do I build it? Well, I'm going to give you, I'm going to define first of all a function g1. The function g1 just maps this yellow disk, first of all, onto this disk up here. Which means, in particular, there's a pre-image of this blue disk. Well, actually, it'll be a round disk, but I've drawn it slightly distorted inside this yellow disk. So I can now map my blue disk just nicely inside this pre-image. Right? So what will happen now is that the blue disk maps inside there, maps up inside the blue disk up there. Now, if I approximate very closely by an entire function, the same thing will happen. So this is my function f1. Now, I want to build the next function, g2. So this function will agree with f1 on this half plane, let's say. Everything that I've already constructed, I will retain. And then I will map this yellow disk up onto this big disk up here, which means that this blue disk now has a pre-image in here. And that then has a pre-image inside there. Because the function f1 also maps the yellow disk or some slightly smaller disk univalently up over something that covers both of those disks up there. So I've got this little disk in here, which goes to here, which goes to there. So now I just define my map G2 on here to map inside that little pre-image. And now I have a map, G2, which has the property that my blue disk maps in the way that I want up to until it ends up inside here. And I approximate arbitrarily closely by a function F2. And I can make sure that my function F2 has the same property. And now I just continue. I take a function g2, which agrees with f2 on that half plane, you know, even more closely than previously. Um, and I have a function g3 up there. I get a, disk, a sequence of disks. You know, I get a disk inside here, which maps in there, which maps in there, which maps into a blue disk we can't see. 
and I continue inductively. And if I make my approximations on these sets close enough, then my functions will be a Cauchy sequence and therefore converge to an entire function, which has all the properties that I want, and I've constructed an oscillating wandering domain. And this construction is, again, very important for our, uh, this is a sort of the base setup of, of what we do. OK, <clears throat> so what I, I mentioned we were thinking about a problem um, which was not related to Elemental's conjecture at all. Um, and it was this one. So not, not this very first one. So this very first question we can ask. So we talked about Eremenko's conjecture. Now we've had wandering domains in the escaping set. And you might ask, well, maybe Eremenko's conjecture is false because there's some wandering domain which is bounded inside, you know, inside the plane somewhere. But the boundary has no escaping points whatsoever on it. Then you would have a bounded component of the escaping set. But actually, it turns out this can't happen. And you already know this, in some sense, because I told you that the escaping set union infinity is always connected. So if this happened, the escaping set union infinity would not be connected. So this is exactly what Phil and Gwyneth were thinking about when they, when they ended up proving something which then implied that the escaping set union infinity is always connected. So they proved if you have any wandering domain in the escaping set, then on the boundary, you have a full harmonic measure set of points. And if you don't know what harmonic measure is, you just think of a dense set of points um, that are actually in the escaping set. So there's always escaping points on the boundary of the wandering domain. But actually, in all the examples that we ever knew of wandering domains that were going to infinity, they were all going to infinity uniformly, which meant that all the points on the boundary were going to infinity. So Phil asked this question. Suppose the user, so he asked it for bounded wandering domain, the bounded escaping wandering domain, is the boundary of U always in the escaping set? And this is a question we managed to answer in the negative, but again, I won't quite talk about that one. I will talk about this without the word bounded, which was also not known, whether there could be any wandering, escaping wandering domain which has no escaping points on the boundary. Um, and I'm still going to change the question a little bit for what we want to do. So I'm going to turn it around. Instead of asking about an escaping wandering domain with non-escaping points on the boundary, I'm going to ask about an oscillating wandering domain with escaping points on the boundary. All right? So you can see these are all very similar questions. So, and, and they can all be solved by very similar techniques. So um, we're going to focus on this question now. Suppose that we have an oscillating wandering domain. Is there, can there ever be an escaping point in the boundary? OK. I think I'm doing OK. So, so we, show that, we show that this can indeed happen. We can construct a wandering domain um, with an oscillating wandering domain with an escaping point in the boundary. So there are two key ideas that I need to tell you um, in addition to the, to the previous proof. So the first thing is, so in the construction that I did, obviously my wandering domain, the, the spherical distance of it as I was going to infinity, well, actually the spherical distance overall of the wandering domain was shrinking down to zero. The spherical diameter, sorry, the spherical diameter of the wandering domain was shrinking down to zero. So all the points on the boundary had the same behavior as the, well, actually, I didn't prove that the whole wandering domain was shrinking down to zero, but certainly I didn't get any information about points on the boundary that were far away. So in order to do this construction, if you want to make a construction of, of a wandering domain which is oscillating, so it comes back to a bounded part of the plane, but it has some point on the boundary that goes to infinity, the spherical diameter of my wandering domain has to go, has to be large in some places. Right? Because there will be points which are, close to, which, are, which are not far away from zero, and there will be points that are close to infinity. So I have to have some definite spherical diameter. So I can't do that if I, construct, if I only have control inside these disks. So instead of using disks, I'm going to use strips. And that's OK, because of Arakelian's theorem. So uh, the key thing about these strips is um, that they have some definite width as I'm going out to infinity. So everything will be always nicely mapped inside the places where I, where I approximate, so that if I make an approximation up to a small Euclidean error, I will still maintain the same structure. So instead of having these yellow disks, which we're mapping up, I'm going to have, sorry, is there another? No, there isn't, actually. Um, so I think I was going to go to the board for this. I'm going to have my sequence of strips. Hmm, do I have a yellow one? Yes. 
So I'm going to have my yellow strip. And I'm just going to use the map. Z maps to 5z. So this is a strip of height 1. It'll map to a strip of height 5. And it will cover, in particular, two nicely well-separated strips of height 1. And then this yellow strip will again map up and cover two strips of height 1. So I've just replaced the disks by strips. That's all I've done. So the second observation from my previous construction is that I was saying, oh, I take these things and I map them inside somehow. And really, it doesn't really matter how I map them inside. So for various reasons, we do want to map them actually in a univalent way. But other than that, it really doesn't matter. So again, here, I could try to construct a wandering domain. I could take a, I could start within my blue strip. Sorry, I don't know whether this is big enough. Can people see? So I could start within this blue strip. And I could take, let's say, a half strip. And now what I know is that this yellow strip, it has some pre-image inside, inside. So this yellow strip maps over here conformally. So this yellow strip has some pre-image inside, which is the little disk that I drew before. So I can just map my half strip inside this strip any way that I want. So in particular, I can map it in such a way that, let's say, I've got some point here, and I want to make sure that this point comes back somewhere to the middle, so that I get my oscillating orbit. But I want that this point on the boundary actually maps kind of really far away, so that when I'm up here, I'm kind of close to infinity. So I want this point to be oscillating, this point to be escaping. And I can easily do this by finding the right conformal map, really, by making this sort of thin enough. So I map this strip inside here. Yeah, we do need something conformal for, uh, for reasons that I probably won't manage to quite explain. Um, to do with the fact that, of course, what we want to do is we want to control. We want to control that. We want to make sure that this point is on the boundary of the actual wandering domain. Right? So right, what I've now done is I've kind of constructed. OK, so, so let, let, let me go on. Anyway, so, so using this kind of method, you can indeed construct you can indeed construct a wandering domain, which has an escaping point on the boundary, but I haven't quite told you why. Uh, how, do, how do we ensure that we have this, this escaping point on the boundary? Um, and we had, a, we had a way of doing this, um, but then we came across another method, um, which is due to Luca Boktala. So Luca Boktala showed that many simply connected domains such as a round disk, can be realized exactly as wandering domains of entire functions. So there exists an entire function for which the unit disk is a wandering domain, for example. Um, and it uses a similar approach as, as what, I, what I just said before. Um, and you know, without being able to go into the details, we can use similar ideas to actually make sure that the half strip that we start out with is exactly a wandering domain. And essentially what we do is, so we come back to this picture over there, what we do is we also put around this, so we make sure that we, we, we let things map on a slightly bigger, bigger domain. And this is where we need, want things to be univalent, because otherwise we'll, we'll lose control. Um, we'll have a slightly bigger domain that maps in this way. And then we'll also have around it, we'll have a little, sorry, I'm going to draw, go over here. So outside of our strip, what we'll do is we'll have a, we'll have a so this is like at the, at the end stage when we're defining our map, right? So on here we're defining our map so that it maps down there inside the strip again in some specific way. And then we also take this curve that goes all the way around it, and we just map that into an attracting basin, just like we did before. So what we'll get in the end is a wandering domain, which is a half strip, 
It's an oscillating one-ring domain. And it has an escaping point on the boundary. And it's surrounded by all these things which go into it, which are actually in attracting basins. So this is what I'm saying here. So we can take, for example, this half strip, right? This is just the half, well, you know, half strip where we take positive real part and imaginary part bounded by one. Then we can find an entire function for which this exact domain is an oscillating wandering domain. The boundary point zero is an escaping point. And because there are all these things around, the closure of the half strip is a connected component of the set of points with unbounded orbits, right? Because it's surrounded by actual curves with bounded orbits that cut it off from anything else. So now, as I mentioned before, well, this is the, the flip result of the one above the escaping wandering domains and harmonic measure. The escaping set on the boundary of an oscillating wandering domain has zero harmonic measure. So the escaping set on the boundary of this thing is certainly totally disconnected. It's totally disconnected, but it's non-empty. So it's zero is the point here. There's no bigger connected uh, part of the escaping set because, well, it can't go out here because these things are going to, to the basin of attraction. It can't be inside here because inside here everything is oscillating. And it can't be along the boundary because then we'd have a positive harmonic measure set. So we found a point component of the escaping set. And that's one way. I mean, I said the example originally, but it's actually an example. We have other examples, other counterexamples to Remenko's conjecture that we can make. But this is one way to make a counterexample to Remenko's conjecture. And uh, I have a few minutes left, so I will just mention a few further results. So actually, there's kind of a whole technique now. And there's uh, various other results that we get from this. So in particular, as I mentioned, we can get an escaping wandering domain, bounded or unbounded, whose boundary contains these non-escaping points. And we call these points that behave differently on the boundary than the domain behaves maverick points. Um, we also have a result which uh, strengthens Bokhtala's result a bit, which shows that we can construct all kinds of basically anything, any, any full compact set can be realized as a wandering continuum of an entire function whose boundaries in the Julia set. So in particular, we got lakes of Wada, which was a long-standing open question. Um, but anything you can draw. So for example, you could draw this set. And, uh, and uh, this is, you know, you can find this. You can find an entire function where there's this set in the, in the so the, the black set is in the Julia set, and all of these white things are wandering domains kind of going off to infinity. The exact, exact set. Um, the, the, the iterates. So, so, so these things are mapping somewhere over to the right, right where there's another copy of this set. Okay, that's not the whole Julia set. This is not the whole Julia set. This is contained in the Julia set, of course. This is contained in the Julia set somewhere. Um, we give a complete description of what sets can arise as bounded for two components and bounded Julia components of transcendental meromorphic functions. Basically, anything you could imagine, sort of, you know. There, 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 there are some simple conditions that have to be satisfied, but uh, subject to those, you can make anything. Um, and finally, um, this is uh, not written yet, but uh, we have sort of a general theorem um, which says that we have some kind of non-autonomous holomorphic system. We can realize this as wandering dynamics of an entire function. So for example, we might have an actual quadratic polynomial. So we might have a set, so not exactly the set in this case, but something which is homeomorphic and close and actually diffeomorphic. Um, to it um, inside the Julia set, and it gets mapped out, but it gets mapped out not in a one-to-one -one fashion as in the previous examples, but the dynamics on it, if we kind of move it back, is the exact quadratic polynomial that we had before. Um, so this was an answer to various questions uh, re uh, coming from work of um, a paper with a lot of authors, uh, Miriam, Nuria, Phil, Gwyneth, and Vasso, um, who are constructing various um, Blaschke products um, and then with certain behavior, and then there was a question whether this could be realized um, by entire functions. And uh, it follows from our result that you can. Um, OK, so it is 10 to 4, so I think I need to stop. So I just uh, say happy birthday, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>